the ones that are really strong, put them in a group, and the other ones that are really strong with each other, but much less with the first group. That's what we're trying to do. <coughs> we must not kid ourselves that variables have zero correlation with other variables. Then, help, we have no connection. Where's the cable gone? Nobody knows. That's maybe the most it was here yesterday. That's the one we know doesn't work. Anyway, I'll keep talking while you think about who stole the cable. That's a mystery. So we treat the off correlation, that little bit on the other items, as if it's noise. It's not the signal we're interested in. So in that case, factor analysis is an extension of classical test theory. The observed value is equal to the true value plus the error. And what we're trying to do with factor analysis is identify the true value and say, those things exist, but they're random noise rather than actually the signal we're interested in. Uh, what else do I want to say? The reason we do factor analysis is to make life simpler. Reduces the complexity of the data. Instead of having to think about 53 items, maybe I only need to think about six ideas, which means that my brain can manage it. Um, and, of course, it reduces, we're increasing the probability that the signal is correct. You know, we've got these satellites listening to the stars to try and find signal. And by random processes, a signal can come in that looks like it's a real signal. Because when you shake the dice enough times, it will come up in a pattern. And that's what we're trying to cancel out, the random pattern by using multiple indicators. Uh, right. Da -da 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 -da. Let's... Okay. The problem with factor analysis is that machines can calculate the connections between items and come up with associations that are statistically robust but un unexplainable. So, remember, we're in a science world where theory and modeling has to explain the results. So, if you don't have a clear mentality as to why does this go together, it's just noise. It's just luck of the data that you had. So, every result has to be explainable by some sort of empirical sorry, theoretical or conceptual model. And the problem with modeling data is that multiple models will fit the same data. A one-factor model might fit the data, but the data might also fit a two-factor or three-factor model. The two factors may be correlated, or one may cause the other. So there are all sorts of possible alternative models. So one of the things we're going to focus on this week is how to tell which model is the right model or the best model. Now, you can identify statistical, this is the one that fits best, but if you can't explain it in light of some theory or pre-existing ideas, then it's probably nonsense. Aha, you're almost there. Maybe you took it with you. No, I don't touch, I don't, I know which one is just, mine. just, uh, okay, it's very no. strange. Yes, I agree, it's very strange. Lock it in so it, I can't take it All away by accident. <laughs> All the cables were lost. We, we take this from one of the computers. Yeah, good, it doesn't need it. We need it. <laughs> um, okay, so now we have to switch on the projector. Good, you're doing good. Okay, this one now I want the pictures on the screen. Good, and 
might have to tell my computer to wait, recognize the screen. I don't think those screws are doing anything. And it should work. It just has to warm, warm up. up. Yeah. But we might have to make my computer recognize the extra protector. Yeah, it works. Ha. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Dimitri, that's fantastic. <laughs> okay. So imagine in your data space, say you have 50 questions and 100 people. You've got 50 columns and 100 rows. And every data point is connected to every data point. So that's a cloud. Now we can think in three dimensions. Left, right, front, back, up, down. Okay? And we can think with a fourth dimension, past, now, future. All right? So Stephen Hawking says four dimensions we can work with. But in this correlation matrix, there's actually one dimension for every variable. And so that's why we use the expression n dimensions. So for every variable, there's a dimension. So I can think of three dimensions. I cannot think in 50, 60 dimensions. I, I just cannot mentally picture it. But if what factor analysis is trying to do is, again, like ordinary least squares, try to minimize the distance of all those points to a vector or a line that goes through the space to reduce the distance. So if this is the clock, if this is the way the data sits, it's if there's a line there and it looks like there's a line there and maybe there's a line here and they group like this, then what we would do is we would use our factors, our factors would attempt to find those vectors that close the gaps. And what we're interested in is the simplest structure, the simplest set of vectors that explain or connect all these data points to each other. And we're not Mel Thurstone back in the 1930s said factors should exhibit simple structure. And up till today, that is what we're working on, the presumption that a simple explanation is defensible. That, in other words, that every variable belongs to one factor, not two factors, not three factors. But we're going to talk about bifactors later on. So our simple structure is every variable goes to one factor, and all fact loadings on that factor are either large and positive or near zero. So it either really belongs or nah, not really, you know? And so when you do an exploratory factor analysis, you will see big, 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 little, 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 little. And that's what we want. The ones on the factor are all big, and the loadings on the not the, my factor are small, small, small. And when they're not, when it's big on one and big on number three at the same time, it violates the simple structure. All right, so we're going to try, we're bears of small brain, so we want to get, let's make it simple. Either it really belongs here, but if it wants to belong on two things, well, which one is it? How do I decide? Every row in the matrix has at least one zero. So here's a person and this items by factor. So here's the items. And somewhere it has a close to zero on one factor, at least one factor. It has no choice, show of belonging to that. And every column, so the factor columns, have some zeros on them. So yeah, 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 no, 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 no. Right? That's what we're following. So all items fall into mutually exclusive groups with high loadings on one factor and weak to zero loadings on all other factors. That's the golden standard, the holy grail of factor analysis. Oh, look, my items, 
nice and lots of zeros and empty space around it. So here's I did a factor uh, a factor analysis of this data set you were using yesterday of eight factors. I told it throw away, don't show me the ones less than 0.10 because it's just too much noise, I can't see. Normally, we would say anything under 0.30, we can pretty much say, eh, why? 30 times 30 is 0.09, it's less than 10%. So we just mentally say, that's so close to zero, let's treat it as if it's zero. And what we will find is that this generally exhibits simple structure. Whether they're supposed to be in this factor or not, these all go down here on factor one. This is small, small, still under 0.30. So even the cross loadings, if I turned it to 0.30, these would all, these red ones would all be zero blank. So, so the question is, should they group together? They do group together, but should they, is the interesting question. Then, these are all small, these red ones are all small, until we come down to here, where <coughs> here's a 45 and a 47. Notice, this is a negative sign and that's a positive sign, so maybe that's a message that number 8 is the opposite of something else. Or it could just mean, are there <coughs> any items on factor 8 that have a strong loading beside this one? There's only one. Blanks and reds, blanks and reds. Actually, according to that, factor 8 doesn't even really have enough items to suggest, let's keep factor 8. And so, what I do when I do exploratory factor analysis, I go, well, I think it's supposed to be 7 or 8, or I want to look at eigenvalues greater than 1. I always look, the first thing I do is I look to the last factor. How many items does it have? If it's only got one item, and it has a cross-loading, that number of items must be wrong. So, rerun it, and kill the last factor. Make it one less and run it again, okay? So if a, an analysis doesn't give you enough items to say there is something here, then the, it does, that factor doesn't exist, it's an illusion. Um, and then when you look at factor seven, there's only two items, and you kind of go, well, maybe even factor seven is no good, but I would do it systematically. I ran it with eight, hmm, doesn't look right. Run it with seven, maybe this will change. If it doesn't, still doesn't look right, run it with six, okay? You can't just accept that it works because it provides a solution. This factor is not real. Notice also this fact item, TI6, under 10, 28, 21, 16, 18, 18, he didn't want to go with anything, which is, uh, oh, maybe I need to go back and look at what's wrong with TI6 elsewhere. So, exploratory factor analysis tells me 8 is wrong. Maybe it's 7, maybe it's 6, maybe it's something else. So, excuse me, is it, is it possible that 8 is wrong, but for example 9 mm -hmm. is uh, right? Yeah. I mean, the uh, is it possible that we don't have to minimize the um, number of factors, but uh, rather increase them? Increase them, yeah. Well, every time you increase the number of factors, you're spreading the items thinner. It's going to try and force them into. The maximum is, if there's 33 questions, the maximum will be 33. One factor for every item, which defeats the purpose. So you could go more, but you're kind of defeating the purpose of grouping things. So it's a trade-off. How many groups can you mentally cope with? But sure, run nine. I'm, I'm already going to 
going to say to you, I think 8 is wrong. I think 8 is too many. If you ran 9, maybe it would be even more disjointed. So, the goal is to simplify the structure where things group strongly. This clearly is a problem for these two items. So, the point of factor analysis, this is what's going on mathematically. It's trying to find the Greek letter lambda, that's the capital L, and the lowercase l. Do we have a whiteboard pen? Uh, I might have one. Maybe. Maybe. Yes. Yeah, we have three. Oh, okay, good, because I brought one. So, that's capital lambda. That's lowercase lambda. They, the letter lambda is always used to indicate the loading of the item on the factor. Psi is the diagonal matrix. Remember, you can picture a matrix of items. So here's item 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. This is the diagonal. In a perfect world, this is 1.0. But in factor analysis, we're throwing away some of the signal because we think it's noise. So in principal components, it would always be 1, 1, 1, 1 because it's 100% of everything. But in factor analysis, we actually want to, well, how much is this? What is the communality? What is the thing that actually, this might be, oh, 75. Okay, we've explained quite a bit of it. So what we're trying to do is identify a simple structure that reproduces the real matrix of everything is, there's a little bit on every item, okay? Because as you saw on the previous page, there's actually, it's, it's displayed as nothing, but it isn't nothing. There is actually something there. And so we're recognizing all of that stuff exists, but we're going to ignore it. We're going to say, it's not important. It's a zero. Let's mentally treat it as a zero so that we can say we're trying to reproduce that matrix of everything is correlated with everything by using a simpler structure that these items only belong on this factor and these items only belong here. So we're trying to find, and the communality is what we're going to use as the side, the variance shared with other variables. And there's a specific or unique variance that relates to variability inside xi not shared with other variables. So it's whether you use correlations or covariances, it doesn't matter if you scale everything, but multiply everything by a thousand or divide it by a hundred, none of that matters because that's just a mathematical transformation. So you can use the covariance matrix or the correlation matrix because the correlation matrix is a standardization of the covariance matrix. So that transformation doesn't matter. So sometimes this whole procedure of factor analysis is called structural covariance matrix or structural covariance modeling. This is not principal components analysis. Okay? PCA is a different beast. It's not factor analysis. And it's one of the biggest tragedies of SPSS that when you do dimensionality analysis, the first thing that comes up is PCA. PCA is not factor analysis because there's no attempt to isolate the error component. So, this is Spearman's original idea back uh, 120 years ago. He was looking at data and he said, okay, obviously the correlation of classics with classics is perfect. And he found the classics the correlation of classics with French was 83, with English 78, and 67 for French and English. So they clearly overlap, which is what I tried to get here at this 
Venn diagram saying there's something common between these different subjects. Now we know French is not English, but the skills that it, the people who get high scores in French tend to also get high scores in classics and English. And Spearman's idea was there must be something common that creates that. And he called that, what did Spearman call that? Do you know? Intelligence? Yeah. And what letter did he use for intelligence? IQ. Hmm? IQ. No, no. He called it G. <coughs> general intelligence. G for general. And so for Spearman, who developed factor analysis and was also influential in intelligence research, he said, there's something going on here. Let's call it the common th contributor, G, the general contributor that makes people's performance scores on these different things highly similar. He called it G. And so you can construct G, well, you can construct any factor as a set of equations. So the score on number one is equal to the loading on the factor plus the error. And the score on number two is equal to the loading on the same factor plus its own unique errors, residuals, disturbance. These are all words that are used to describe what this U is. And the formula for X3 is equal to lambda of that one on the same factor. And then you can generalize to any number of items and factors by saying, the matrix lambda, that's why it's a capital L, not the little L. The little L is for this specific thing. The big L is the matrix. The matrix of loading of item one on factor one, item one all the way to the loading of item one on factor K, down to the loading of item Q on factor one, across to the loading of item Q on factor K. Okay, so this is pretty conventional matrix symbolism, right? You can get this in Microsoft Word. It's just a ooh, equation, and you put it in, and you know, it's pretty cool. So the factor F, well, there's one factor all the way to Q factors, depending on how many items and factors you think you have, and there's a matrix of errors. And all of this can be multiplied together using matrix algebra, which you know you need to know how to spell. You don't need to know how to do it. You just need to know that, oh yeah, they're doing matrix algebra in the back somewhere. They're flipping, transposing these matrices and multiplying them by each other to create identities and all of that stuff. It's uh, undergraduate matrix algebra stuff, you know. I can spell it. And I can know that it's happening, but I don't know how to do it. And it's not necessary to know how to do it to be a researcher because the computer knows how to do it. Okay. But you need to know that this is really important. These, this set of disturbances or errors are all uncorrelated with each other. So the correlation from U1 to U2 is zero which means you don't, let's force U1 to be correlated with U2, that violates the fundamental structures of classical test theory and factor analysis. That errors, the things I cannot explain in the universe, somehow magically become correlated with other things that I can't explain in the universe. They're, they're truly random. They can't have a pattern other than by chance. So if you force it, if you impose it, you're violating our understanding of the way the universe works. And I know that you can read books and journal articles where people correlate the disturbances 
and yes, it will improve the fit, but logically it makes no sense. So, as my professor said to me, correlating residuals is the last resort of the desperate. Please, it is. there are better solutions than correlating residuals. Even if Professor Barbara Byrne, she's, we're not worthy, shows you in her book on factor analysis that you go ahead and correlate residuals because these words are somehow, these items are somehow similar to each other. If they're that similar, you're bloating the specific, right? You just delete, delete one of them. Don't correlate them. And, oh, number five in factor one, we're going to correlate with that with number three in factor two. Huh? How does that work? So, if you see it, go. No, don't do that. Don't do it. Intercorrelations of items come from the F, not from the residuals. So, here I've got all these items belong to factor one, and then I'm going to correlate two items. No. Correlate the residuals. Don't do it. Factor analysis does not try to account for all the observed variants. We're not trying to explain everything. We're only trying to identify the shared variants that say these items belong together in a set. And it's shared on the diagonal inside. That's these things have loading on side. So it's accounting for the covariance of the, or correlation between the manifest variables this is not principal components analysis. Principal component analysis does not have this. This gets sucked into here, called the component. And it's nonsense. It's, 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 it's a legitimate mathematical tool, but it's not factor analysis. Okay. So we're looking at, we're trying to get what is the loadings of these items on factor one? That's what we're interested in. And then the loadings on factor two. And we're calling those the communalities. And how you get a communality is a dance. There's some things we have to try to do because remember, we don't know what the true score is and we don't know what the error is. We only know what the observed value was. And we're trying to divide the observed value into the true score and the error score. So we have to use a proxy system for that. And these are the two most common proxy systems. The square of the multiple correlation coefficient of each variable with every other variable. So we take your matrix and we correlate all the items with each other, we square it, and we get this loading that says this item is correlated this much with all the other items. Or we take the largest of the absolute values of the correlation coefficient between the item we're interested in and one other variables. Now every software system, every algorithm will decide one of these two solutions, this is how we're going to do it. Frankly we don't care, but what we're looking at is this loading represents how much this item shares with other items in the group. Obviously, it's a value between one, 1 and 0, and we want it as close as possible to 1. It also means it cannot go over 1, because you cannot have more than 100%. Even if politicians say they're 110% behind you, it's a lot. No one can be more than 100%. So, it cannot go over one. However, in the real world, when you're doing this data analysis, you will find that, mathematically, you'll get an answer like 1.04. And that's a red flag. 1.04? Uh-oh, there's a problem. We might be explaining more than 100% of the variance. We need to look into this. And that's... Uh, thing that we'll look at is how to identify those negative error variances when what's left over is less than zero. And it can't be less than nothing, right? <laughs> That's the meaning of nothing. There's nothing there, so how can you be less than nothing? A lot of people use a rule of thumb. If the communality is below 0.5, 
is not very strong. <sighs> Clearly, bigger is better, but anything under 0 0.3 is probably more zero than something. Anything between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 is a maybe it's something, right? So don't just cut it off at 0.5 and say that's too small. 0.3 everybody's happy with that, yeah, okay, 0.3 you can cut off.